Susio Talk Podcast. I am perched on a mountain top. <laughs> Not too far off the, the ground. Sea level. How far above are we? 100 feet? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that much, but it's beautiful. Thank you for inviting me to your home, Chef Austin Falls. Thank you for coming. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, how long you been living out here? Um, we've probably been here at this spot for like a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you enjoy living here? I love living here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing, honestly. Um, you know, the first time I came down to Monterey. Yeah. I kind of thought like this is this is a place where I want to like you know set, you some, set your set roots. Some roots. Got you. Know? you. I usually, might. usually I go to a place and I'm like this is where I want to die. Yeah. <laughs> or end no. up this is where it ends. That's that's exactly what I thought honestly. Uh, there you go. I was and gonna say because it it's a little morbid, but you know it's all right, chef. You know it's it is life and death. A lot of things, right? This this weird thing that we're doing here. No, totally. Life. The, Honestly, the older that you get to, I think you think about it more mm-hmm. about like where you want to, you know, where do you like truly like want to start a family if you want to do that or, yeah, you know, really start your career. <clears throat> and I do think that like, like part of the chef life yeah, is like you're bouncing around to all these great restaurants and stuff. But at the same time, too, you're moving from like a big city to like you know, another city that's maybe, like, super expensive. Yeah. You know, they're kind of, like, these, like, luxury spots. But in doing all of that and chasing that dream, you kind of, like, leave your friend groups behind and, like, connections that you made in other cities and stuff. And you got to start over. And I just kind of got tired of it. Tired of starting. You're you're starting over. You're a nail on the head because I often struggle with that. Yeah. But if, you know, if... Live the life you want to live, obviously, you know, but for me, I'm like, if I stay somewhere too long, I'll like get too comfortable and I won't have the drive that I once had. And I don't feel like myself if I don't feel passionate, like getting out there and doing what I'm doing. Yeah, That's yeah. why I'm still here in the Bay because I'm like doing this kind of shit. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think I've interviewed enough chefs out here. You know what I mean? So that's what kind of keeps me here. But if it wasn't that, I'd probably be, I'd probably be gone. Yeah. You know, I think once, because like the way I think about it is like a cook. You go to the city, you work at the best restaurant they got, you make it to either meat station, you know, or sous chef, and then you bounce, basically, like when you're trying to learn, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how do you do it? How did, how did your, uh, what was your thought when you're like, okay, I want to be a chef. Like, what do I do? First thought. Um, first thought was to just try and get in a kitchen. Mm-hmm. That was my first thought. Yeah. But it was really challenging. It was just like really challenging. Cause like, I think I was, you know, 17, 18. Yeah. And places, they just went hire me. Yeah. Just be like, look at this like little, this little kid, like trying to come into the kitchen and like, you know, work with, work with all of these crazy people. Yeah. Doing this crazy job and. You know, they didn't think you had that dog in you. Yeah, they didn't basically. think I had the dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you. Know, you. They didn't know, but yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So I struggled with it for a while. Yeah. Um, what was the first place that kind of took you in? I so I actually I went to culinary school. Okay. Um, Which culinary school? I went to La Cordon Bleu. Oh, in Atlanta. You get money back for the fuck? I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> you did. Yeah. How much was that payout? Was it a lot of money or was it just like two grand? Um, the I mean, pay- you don't have to tell me the exact amount, but you know. Well, the payout, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if I got anything from the payout. Okay. But what they did was they forgave like any loans that I took out. Oh, really? Yeah. So you went to culinary school basically for free. Yeah. How would you describe the? Which is crazy. That's the crazy. teachers there, like, who were the chefs? Do you keep up with any of them? Um, you know. I don't. Okay. It was a long time ago. Right. It was probably, it was like 12 years ago now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a while. So, um, throughout the years, like, I went back to the campus, and I would go, like, see some of the teachers again. Yeah. But I definitely remember, I remember their faces. Yeah. You know? I remember, like, one guy was, like, at 
ex Ritz Carlton, like executive chef. Mm -hmm. And he was just like a badass teaching us like pastries and shit. Yeah. And, like, you know, I love food, but I, I wasn't like super educated when I went to culinary school. Right. So I was seeing like a lot of this shit for like the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like getting blown away, you know. Every day. Every day. It was crazy. <laughs> it was so crazy. Yeah, like for for example, um they have those cookies called uh palmiers. Uh -huh. I think I think that's what they're called. Um yeah, and it's just like pop pastry that you roll sugar into and then roll it up and bake them. Mm -hmm. You cut them and bake them or whatever. And they were fucking so good, dude. Yeah. They were so good and like it, it's like those things where I, I like would go to culinary school and be like, damn, this is wild. Like mm -hmm. this is that's kind of like what really got me hooked, you know? Right. The intricacy of the simplest things. Yeah, just the simplest things and like <clears throat> just about like, oh, I haven't had that before. Yeah. You know, I never had lobster before I went to culinary school. I remember the the first day we like did lobster. Yeah. You know? Just those things, like. What did you think? Did you did you were you ever scared to try anything? Any ingredients that you were like, nah, not um, right now. Because I know, like, when I was a cook, I was like, I wanted to try it. Give, that, give yeah. me the century egg. Give me the fucking foie yeah. gras. Give me all the nasty shit. Century you egg. Know? That that one's like. That shit's hardcore, bro. That's a little hardcore. That's a one time dude. thing that for me. Shit's that's wild. it. After that. The foie, though, like, yeah. Maybe I was like a little hesitant. Yeah. But I would always do it. I always mm. do it. You know, you got to. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're going to learn. Like raw octopus, you Ooh. know? You know how you get like the, the like sashimi sometimes? And it's yeah. like a big old fucking chunk of raw octopus and it's got the little like suction cups on it? Yeah. I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah. That's right. a little too much for me. I never, I don't think I've ever seen that. I guess I've never gone to a sophisticated enough place. No, to no, no, no. Because I, I, we actually ate that in Texas. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Whoa. It was weird. Texas. Like, as a kid growing up, we would go to like a sushi spot in Texas. Damn, they don't give a fuck. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Well, shit. Here on Sushi Talk, we take it all the way back. Where were you born? Uh, so I was born in San Diego. Mm hmm. Yeah. And um, kind of <laughs> lived out there for like the first couple years of my life. Yeah. Do you and love San Diego? Are you a beach guy? I like the beach. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I guess, right? It's right I love the fuck the beach. out there. Yeah, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I love the beach. It's like super relaxing. So I think that's why I'm like pulled towards it. Drawn to the water. Yeah. Got you. What'd yeah. your parents do down there? So my parents were in the Navy. Oh, shit. Yeah, both of them were in the Navy. Damn. So you were living that Annapolis life. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Did they yeah. want you to be in the Navy? No. Really? Uh, yeah. No. They don't like the Navy. No, they weren't about it. Okay. Yeah. It like, was just a job to them? I think. <clears throat> yeah. Isn't that crazy? My my mom does the same shit. She's a, a CEO. And, and, and I'm like, how do you compartmentalize your job enough that you hate it, but you still will go every day? Like, I love what I do. And there's been kitchens where I'm like, I'm not doing this in here. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it, it's always a wild thing to just look at and, and think about. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Maybe that's just like the journey of working for 50 years. Right. Or After half. a while, you just, you're just like, you're you're not, unfazed by it. Yeah, you're, you're not going to have like, not every day it's going to be where you're like waking up stoked to go, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I just feel like I need, I need to learn how to embrace a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. You know? you know, what's crazy, though, is like, um, and this happened to me in the kitchen, actually, at the beginning of the year. Yeah. But it was just like on the days where nothing goes wrong, mm -hmm. which is a normal day. Yeah. Like, dude, those are your good days. Those are just like the those days. Are the best days. Yeah. That you got to be super grateful for. Yeah. Like you get home and like reflect on like your day or whatever. And you're like, huh, it was just normal. Like those days, you you need to mark them down, because the reality is, like at least in a kitchen, you rarely have those. Yeah, you know, it's either like this person called out, or this order didn't show up, or like you know, 
oh, the sink back here is like broken mm -hmm. or, you know, it's just so, so much crazy stuff. And like on some days, dude, it's like 30 of those happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think for the most part, people keep negative mental logs. Yeah. You know, nobody. I'm probably pretty guilty of that. Yeah. For, I mean, I think chefs are pretty deprecating people like. You know, everything's always like, hey, look at this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though you're like really proud of someone, you still find a way to like make a joke about it or like, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's just our nature, you know, just to like. That's how we kind of like give praise. I guess. Exactly. You know, it's, it's like, uh, I feel like there's this narrative right now that is happening. And like, I get, I understand that it's hard to run a restaurant. Uh -huh. Right. But like, Let's not make that our identity. Every time you talk to a fucking chef, it's like, my restaurant is so hard to run. It's like, you chose to open it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I don't know. There's only so much you can rely on the government. And I think we, we do that way too much as an industry. And that's why in 2020, we all fell behind. Yeah. it really pulled the rug out from under us. And we we're like, oh, nobody does care about us. We're all alone, except for Guy Fieri. I mean, dude... That's kind of how it is. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, no one, no one does really care about, like, the restaurants and, like, hospitality. They might say that they do and, like, whatnot. But, like, at the end of the day, the people in the town, they're just going to be sad, like, yeah. if, if your restaurant closed. Right. You know. How do you, um, how do you stay positive when things are going negative in the kitchen? Uh, He's like, I fucking you know, don't. It's fucking... <laughs> it, it's really hard. It's really hard because I can't tell you a scenario that, like, all the scenarios are different. Yeah. You know? And, like, sometimes the scenario could be, like, I need that spoon right now. Like, I need that spoon. Where's that spoon? You know? It could just be something that happens in, like, 30 seconds. Or it could be something, like, as prolonged as, like, man, our, our recipe that we're trying to follow right now we're three days in and now, yeah. now it's messed up mm. and it's a five day journey, you know? And so now you're going to have to take it off the menu or figure out some kind yeah. of dumb fuck way to make it happen. Or like employees like talking back or like, mm. you know, yeah. not, not listening or, you know, it's challenging. Yeah. But I think now I'm at the point where I can kind of identify like when I'm in those moments being like man this is really hard like as it's playing out right. and then i just like you know you gotta take a deep breath and come at it like from like a mm -hmm. more professional standpoint yeah where do you think it comes from that the the cooks sometimes are defiant do you think that's like training that they've had in the past that they think is better yeah probably like you know maybe not necessarily that it's better mm -hmm. some people for sure some yeah. people just think that like they know a better way you know right and that's not necessarily the case but i also think that like maybe those people worked in a restaurant where they could like talk back a little bit right or at least you know kind of it, it's kind of like arguing to like find a middle ground mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like oh the croutons are too big and then the other person will be like well helen tore him today <coughs> and they'll just go back and forth like banter until they're like okay well they're fucked up make new ones yeah or like that we're gonna figure it just cook them and we'll figure it out right yeah so like i don't know I get what you're saying. I sometimes get what you're saying. it's frustrating. Where you just, I feel like sometimes we spend too much time arguing and not enough time fixing the problem. Yeah. And if we just fix the problem, then we won't have a problem anymore. Right. We won't That's, have anything to dude, talk it's about. It's crazy. I'm like, yo, can you put up these boxes for me? Right. And then we, we talk about it for like three minutes. And I'm like, <clears throat> oh, we could already be done with this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes you fall in the, well, I'll just do it. Right? Yeah. And then you just end up doing everything because yeah. you just do it. But you can't do that. No, I know. Yeah, you can't. Because no. you'll, you'll burn out. No. And, you know. You'll straight up burn out. But I feel like the other thing, too, like, is how are you going to be able to lead people? Yeah. Like, you have the objective, <clears throat> you know. And, like, although it is, it is very complicated every day. 
to like run a restaurant. Yeah. But like, it's not complicated per se. Mm -hmm. Orders come in, put them away correctly. You know, here's the recipe or the idea. And like, we just have to execute it within a time frame. Yeah. So the, it's not complicated, but I think it's complicated trying to, you know, work with the team and be able to train them to like hit all the standards throughout the, the day, the week, the month, mm -hmm. you know, that's the complicated part. And that's part of being a chef. I feel like it's not just like cooking the food, but it's also figuring out how to run and manage something like that. Cause if you figured that out, right, then you could take, you could come up with any food idea and be able to like hire people on and develop your systems right. and then train them and, and so on and so forth. So I think that's important to develop too, you know? Yeah. Or I, I, I'm like trying to develop that more. Right, right, right. Yeah. They didn't teach you all that at Le Cordon Bleu? No, no, no. <laughs> Not at all, dude. Yeah. <laughs> what did you learn at Le Cordon Bleu? Oh, dude, I learned a bunch of shit. Technique? Yeah, technique, Mainly. Dude. It seems like Le Cordon Bleu, like, they got a bunch of industry chefs that were burnt out after, like, 30 years, some hardcore motherfuckers, and yeah. those were the instructors. Yeah. Who were, like, not going to fill out the paperwork, not going to fucking do yeah, all kinda... the bureaucratic <laughs> shit, but they're going to teach you how to do some dope work. It's kind of true. You know? Yeah. Um, I definitely think so, you know? Like, we learned... There's a lot of good technique that I learned at... Mm -hmm. Le Cordon Bleu. Yeah. You know, just like all the, like from sauce work to like butchery yeah. to recipes. And, you know, I have, I still have all of it. Yeah. I what still, are, what are those schools like? Cause like, is it a building? Is it a campus? Like what? It, Cause no. I know CIA is a campus, Johnson and Wills campus. I couldn't imagine if it's a certificate program that it's a campus. It, it wasn't big enough to be a right. campus. Okay. Like, I guess it would be a campus, but it was more of like, you know, the doctor's offices where there's like... Chef, you were in a strip mall? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I don't, hey, whatever, bro. It, it was like a nice strip mall area mm -hmm. over in, uh, I think it was Decatur. Yeah. Not, not Decatur. No, I forget where it was, in Atlanta. And then, so how did you end up in Atlanta from San Diego? All right, so, yeah. So, uh, I was a kid, mm -hmm. and then um, at one point, my parents moved away from each other. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. I went and moved to Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So, I was probably like five around this time. And then, <laughs> uh, that's where I lived. That's where I grew up, you know? Grew up there. Do you love it? Is it as cool as people say it is? Savannah? Yeah, I've never been there. Dude, Savannah's cool. Yeah. yeah, Savannah's sick. Like, I think now I really enjoy going to visit, but to live there, it's like it's that's like a whole not like ballpark, you know? Right. What? Well, why is that? Why it's, is it better to visit? Well, you just get to like you get to do all the highlights and everything that you know you grow and know to love Savannah for. Yeah. But then you don't have to live there. You don't have to deal with like the humidity or like oh god you know the i love the i love southern people but it comes with like another side of things right i get that and get that. the food you know the food is different mm -hmm. not that it's bad but you know i think i'm more drawn to like this food and it's kind of weird because i got roots in both places yeah so it's like pick one or the other you know mm -hmm. I think I finally, I finally passed the point. So I'm 31 now. So I think now I've been living in California for 16 years. Yeah. And Georgia for 15. So it's kind of like I just passed the middle ground. Okay. Yeah. You're trying to become more Californian though. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. You're going to achieve it, chef. Yeah. Um, and so you're out there living in Savannah and what's yeah. your first job? Growing up. Dude, first job with Chick-fil-A. Oh, dope. <laughs> yeah. Dope. My pleasure. Yeah. My uh, pleasure. That's <laughs> fucking <laughs> place, dude. I had this kid crazy? I had this cook work for me and he he would say my pleasure. And I'm like, yo, dog, why are you saying that? You gotta chill out. And he's like, Oh, Chick-fil-A. Like, they oh. show you, they teach you how to say that. And I'm like, oh. It's ingrained. Yeah, it is. 
It you is. Just, you just go. You should go to Chick Fil A and fuck with them. And say my pleasure yeah, back to them. Say thank you, thank you, thank you. Just yeah. keep, just keep fucking with them. Yeah. They're gonna be like, the Matrix <laughs> is gonna have a split. Uh, 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 how do you? How does Chick Fil A work? What's that kitchen like? What's the? Dude, Chick Fil A. What was, is? It what was is a stations? machine. Yeah. It was a machine. So they were. I don't know. There, there was like the front, the yeah. reg, the register uh-huh. or whatever. If everything's fried. Is there just like fryers? There's no grill, right? There, I guess we had like a, almost like a George Foreman. Oh, right. You know what I'm talking about? Like a panini press right. kind of thing. For what? What item? For uh, the char grilled chicken. Oh, got it. Yeah. Got it. Chicken cutlet. That shit's good. <laughs> does, does the chicken get seasoned with anything after it comes out of the fryer? Uh, no. It's no. already... It's already ready to go. Does it come in frozen and breaded, or does it get breaded there? It gets breaded there. It gets breaded there. At, at least it did when I worked there, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So there was, like, the register, and then there was, like, the, the sandwich maker. Yeah. I guess you'd have, like, a fryer, depending on the size of, like, the operation or whatnot. Yeah. And then there was, like, a whole breading section station. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was pretty wild. I worked in like one where it was like you could walk up to like a window outside or it was a double car drive through. So you couldn't go in? You couldn't go in. No. Got it. But how, how big are these places, like square footage wise? It was pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. How how big was it? Like a gas station? Yeah, their facilities are pretty like five hundred square feet. Five hundred square feet? Uh, damn. I don't know. That sounds like a three thousand dollar apartment in San Francisco. It was, it was like, <laughs> it was yeah, it was probably like a two bedroom, yeah, apartment, something like that. It was okay. pretty small, dude. And um, damn, how long did you work there? I worked there for like a year. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I so uh, they just threw they threw me on like the hardest section. Okay. Right off the bat, you know, fryer section or what is it? The sandwich. Oh, sandwich Bill, oh, you're like I'm sandwich basically guy. the cooks are just. Hucking fried chicken at you, yeah. and you're like putting yeah. it on bread. It was crazy. So, the, so you're in between the register people and the fucking cooks. And, and the <laughs> yeah, straight up. That's a lot of pressure, yeah. bro. And I was 15. Oh. And uh, yeah, I was kind of stoked though, cause like that I got a job. Yeah. I was like, cool. I'm gonna make some money. You know. What did you want to spend your money on? Like, what was the what was the like motivator? Uh, just probably going out like with friends and. Mm-hmm. Just doing dumb shit, you know? Right, right. Stuff like that. Like, uh, yeah. I just wanted to have some money on me. Right, right. <laughs> feeling feeling like a baller or whatnot. Right, right. $150 paychecks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, straight up. Yeah. Because yeah. it, was, it was wild, you know? I think I was getting paid like 7 seven ten. Yeah, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. That was the, the minimum wage back in the day. And I'll I tell you what. It was hard. Yeah. It was hard, dude. Yeah. I would go in and just get crushed. Hard work at Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Because they're busy all fucking all day. day. Yeah, I'd get there at 4, and I, re- I would relieve like the... P.M.? Yeah, P.M. Okay. Yeah, so after school. Yeah, i go. Ooh. Yeah, after high after school. After school dude. rush and then dinner rush? Yeah. And then late night and rush? And it would be like 4 to 9.30 were the hours, and we would just be like steady. Yeah. Like the whole way through. The whole, there's no, there's no stopping. No stopping. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and then how long did you work there? You said. Uh, like a year. A year. Uh, what made you kind of be like, yo, this is not for me? Dude, they just there was just like some it was like some crazy scenario that went down, but yeah. Basically, like one of the managers got into like a car accident. Uh huh. And then he was gonna be out <clears throat> for like three or four days. Okay. And uh, it was like the rest of the week, like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. And he was the the back of the house manager. Mm -hmm. So they were just like, cool, like you'll do it all. Talking to me. Yeah. And we were just super busy. And it was on like a buy one, get one free Chick-fil-A sandwich day. Yeah. So you come in and order five and you would get 10. Mm -hmm. And it was just wild. And yeah, I just wasn't feeling it. I can see yeah. that. I can see that. Yeah, I kind of, 
I kind of did them dirty, so, you know, sorry, but I'm not sorry, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, all good, uh, man. I definitely just, like, I've walked out, like, 10 minutes into my shift, like, mm. just turn around. Just like, I'm not told doing nobody. this. Not today, baby. Yeah. And just, you know, I left. And I felt kind of bad, but. Whatever, chef. Whatever. They, they gave someone else the opportunity. Yeah, I gave him a year, too. Huh? I gave him a year. Yeah. Good, good. Year of hard time. service. Yeah. Uh, when you walked out, uh, how old are you? 15? 15, yeah. Were so your parents like, what the fuck is wrong with you? No. Nah. No, they nah. were like, take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think my dad knew. He was just like, he'll be fine. You can find another job. Like, right. You don't have to do anything in the world. Yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. He knew. What'd you find? After that? Yeah. Um. So I worked, after that, I worked at a movie theater. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. interesting. Doing right. what? Just Concessions? Like, well, just kind of like a little bit of everything. Right. Did you ever work the movie reels? No. No. So right. I, I didn't do that. That was the only thing. Do you know how that works? Not really. They never like let you up there? I think I went up there like once. I bet it is a dark room. It's a fucking, really creepy guy dude, doing it. Yeah, it's like crazy. It's like all upstairs. And like, it's like a big, huge hallway like around the whole building. Yeah. And then you can just go to like the back of each theater. Yeah. And it's kind of creepy, like, because we only have one guy who would do it, mm -hmm. who would do that job. Yeah. But you, like, never see him, you know? And then, like, he would just work upstairs alone. The like Phantom of the Opera shit? Yeah. I'm sure it would get a little scary. Yeah. That's a fucking... Because, like, if you think about it, we work in kitchens because there's people there and we can have camaraderie. Yeah. This motherfucker's just up there with movies. I bet you, though, he's, like, one of the movie buffs. Oh, I'm sure. Probably enjoys going to trivia. I wonder if he ever, off. like, slipped in, like, you know, some extra shit, like, fucked with people. Maybe. Maybe. That's knows? what I would do. Some fight club shit? I would do something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, what movies were in the movies when you were... Do you remember? Dude, I remember um, Fast and the Furious. The first those. one? No, I think it was like the seventh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, or the fifth. Or, uh, it was 2010, yeah, 2011, maybe. Uh, yeah, not really. I really don't. Yeah, I, I, I picture you just like taking out like uh, Vin Diesel fat heads. Yeah, yeah. But around the fucking <laughs> the movie theater. It was. It was. Uh, that job was cool. Yeah, it was fun. I I worked with like, it was like basically like my whole high school friend group. We all oh there. got it, got yeah. it. So you're all just smoking weed, working at the movie theater. Pretty much, yeah, <laughs> dude. Yeah, we would just do dumb shit. Like we'd try and throw the broom into the trash can. Like from the, oh yeah the, yeah I know that game from the like very top of the yeah. movie theater. Spartans throw. Yeah, fucking, yeah, exactly, yeah. dude. Yeah, so much fun to be had with cleaning. You know. Yeah, and they were pretty lenient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were pretty chill. Oh, your manager's like fucking 18 years old? Nah, <laughs> nah. Uh, he's like mid-20s. Okay. He is this guy named Rodney. And he's always like, I'm, I'm going to be a superstar. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, he took his job really seriously. Is too. he ever a superstar? No. Where's he at? <laughs> he didn't no. make it. He didn't no. make it. He's probably still working at that same movie theater. Maybe he did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then did you work there through all high school? I worked there um, to like the end of my senior year. Right. Yeah. And then is it time to go to college at this point? No, it's time to go to college. Did you decide that culinary school was the first place to go or did you go to regular school first? No, I went to like university. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Georgia Southern University. Okay. Um, How was that experience? It was cool. It was, it was definitely like, it was a lot, you know. Georgia Southern was kind of like a party school. Was it like one of them football school? Football. Yeah, yeah football. definitely. Football, party school. <laughs> football. Party school. Deep in the South. Yeah. 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 You guys, The Water Boy is a documentary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, literally, like everyday life. That's, um, that's funny. It was crazy, though. Just like, because I'm like from Savannah, I guess, but. Yeah. Um, I always had this like other element to my life of like California and and like that other culture and mm -hmm. going to college, 
you really see like all the different areas of the South. Yeah. There would be like people from like Northern Georgia or Alabama. And yeah. like, yeah, it was just like a huge melting pot of like a lot of Southern people and like culture and, yeah. and what, what that is. And yeah, I had a lot of fun. I did, but I, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. What so was your major? I was undeclared. Undeclared mate. So undeclared. what the fuck do you study at that point? Just general? Yeah, it's just in like general. Got yeah. you. The thirteenth grade. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I didn't. I, I don't know. I didn't know what to hey, do. I hear you, man. I I just went to culinary school because I fell into it. It's not like, I yeah. You know, chose me. Yeah. Um, and you have a job during this time, college? No. Okay. No. You're so good. I took the first semester off. Got it. Yeah, which was it was kind of nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was nice not working. Yeah, they got one of them. Uh, one of them. What is it? The skip year or whatever in uh, in other countries where you like don't work and don't go to school. But you going go, to school and not having to work is fucking dope. It's dope. Yeah. Yeah. Because you get to go travel. But yeah, exactly. Exactly. What I wish doing? I would have done that. Honestly, I wish I would have just been like, all right, cool. I'm done with high school. Literally just fuck around for a whole year. Like, who cares what you do? Just enjoy it. Go see the world. Yeah. Yeah. Go see the world. Work. Don't work. Whatever. Go Anthony Bourdain that shit. Yeah. Because at some point, you're just going to have to, like, work. Yeah. Unless you're rich. And so when does Le Cordon Bleu enter the picture? Um, so Le Cordon Bleu, it was, like, after the first year of college. Yeah. Yeah. So I moved home, like, after. I did a semester at George Southern. And I moved back to Savannah and did a semester at the community college there. Okay. And it was, like, within that time frame where I was kind of just being, like, huh, I'm, like, thinking about going to culinary school. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I just applied one day, and they were, like, you know, like, a week or two later, they were, like, cool, you're accepted. So I was, like, all right, you know. Um, so I just kind of started to plan on, like, moving up to Atlanta. Yeah. And I had, uh, like, some friends from school who were already living up there. And, yeah, I was kind of just, like, trying to map things out. Um, yeah, so I started culinary school when I was 19. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I remember, too, because I, like, just turned 19. It was, like, the the day before was like my birthday yeah or something like that what was the breakdown of the people at the uh, school like the your classmates were they older younger same age um i think it was it was a good mix honestly yeah um there were a couple young people like i wasn't the youngest but it was a lot you know like a lot of like uh people coming out of the military yeah stuff like that or like um we had, like, a couple, of like, housewives who just, like, wanted to, like, learn how to cook. Right. Um, I yeah. saw that a lot, too. You see that a lot? Yeah, that, that was housewives, second career people. Because um, you went, a, you went to, to uh, Johnson & Wales? Johnson & Wales, yeah. 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 But there was, a, there was everybody. Everybody was there. Really? Which, which makes you question, right? Because when you go to regular college, everyone's your age. For yeah. The, for the most part. When you go to fucking culinary school, there's like people that are 40 years old and you're like, what the fuck am I studying? Yeah. Like, but also there's the other side of like, well, that's pretty cool that like this person who's this age is just now starting this journey that I'm starting, but I'm fucking 20. Right. So it's like, it gives you kind of like, okay, I got 20 years on this fucking guy. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the shit. I can fuck around know? for 20 yeah, years. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. I can be, <laughs> fuck around for 20 years, look like this dude, and still fucking succeed. Yeah. You know? Like, so it's, it's whatever. It's true. Um, so the Cordon Bleu, how, how long is that program? The, um, so initially I was in like the one year program uh-huh. or, or the nine month. I, I forget. Something like that. Um, yeah. But then I ended up doing the associates. Got you. Yeah. They had to fund their Ponzi scheme, so they yeah. were like, please do another yeah. year. <laughs> exactly. For nineteen ninety nine, you I can have hurt. your associate's degree. <laughs> Dude, no, it was, it was kind of honestly it's kind of fucked up. Like, yeah. How easy they make it for you to just do all that. You know? That's a crazy thing, is like, you know, 
let's say you were coming straight out of high school. Like, you're in high school, you're in class, you have to, like, raise your hand, ask to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And then in, like, a month or two, let's say you graduate, then I could just, like, apply to school and, like, apply for thousands of dollars of loans. Where, like, a month ago, I just had to raise my hand and ask it to go to the restroom. Right. You know? It's crazy how they can trap you in that shit. Uh-huh. Yeah. You could fall for something like... um the Ponzi scheme, yeah, like that, and then you're thirty thousand dollars in debt and mm. trying it, to figure out how to pay that shit off. Being a fucking line cook, starting from the bottom. Yeah, debt doesn't seem that much when it's on paper. No, nah. right, when you see thirty thousand dollars on paper, you're like, yeah, I'll, like, like, cool. I'll be able to take care of it. But then when you truly break down what you bring home versus what you give the government versus like what you need to live, it's like everyone's in debt. <laughs> like there's no one that's not in debt yeah you know and if they are it's taken them if they aren't it's taken them years to get to that place yeah you know uh it's just a game uh, it's kind of weird i don't know the rules of this game me neither uh, dude but you know me I'll, neither. I'll find i'll figure it out the rich people out there though they definitely borrow a lot of money oh for sure and that's the thing about these most of these rich people are like it's just like kind of estimated like net worth and shit it's like i don't know like this how do you calculate that is that real is that true value because we put value on it yeah you know it's like uh gold and silver like for example yeah you know there, there's some people in this world who don't need that and they are like value a shirt or a blanket and then there's other people that like that's what they value is like the shiny things the the things that other people say is what you should like. Yeah. You know, um, the music industry does that. Movies, like, it's all marketing. It's all fucking, like, programming you to, like... You think people are, like... Well, I know that they do, but do you think that deep down they, like, rig it like that? To- I, I think that deep down they know human psychology and they can... Um, you can control a group of people because they know how to do that. You know, like people that run the country know how to run the country. That's why we all, everybody always sits around and talk about politics and shit. And it's like, do you know how to fucking run the country? <laughs> like, go ahead. Yeah. You know, like start, you know, it's like, come on, man. So I think people need to get perspective first and, and learn before they um, say it. But yeah, of course, uh, I think, that there's people that know more than us. Yeah. And there's some things that unfortunately just have to be the way they are for the greater good, even if some people are suffering from it. And that is unfortunately just like good and evil and like 50 50 and yin and yang and all that. Yeah, yeah. But like, who's, we can't solve that riddle. You know, people are trying to solve it. And it's like, it's unsolvable. I think it's meant to be unsolvable. Exactly. That's yeah. that's the thing. Because ultimately, you need something to fall back on. So if you don't have, like, say you broke your legs tomorrow and couldn't cook. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> you would feel like you weren't yourself because you're like, I can't cook. I can't do the thing that, like, drives me to do more things, you know? And then you become that. I know I got hit by a car. And I couldn't fucking Terry cook. Did you get hit by a car? Yeah, I got hit by a fucking car. The side view mirror hit my shoulder, fractured it. I couldn't cook oh, for a month at, at the restaurant. And I, was, I felt like nothing, like no one, you know? <laughs> and it's like I put everything I had on this, on this thing, this position, uh-huh. you know? And then that got stripped away, and my health became what's important. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, your health is what's ultimately like the most important thing in the world, you know, but to get that, you need all these other things that society kind of put in place, like like money, for instance, like who, yeah. who invented money and why? Right. Like, I know we need it now because we're just like, it is what it is. But like, who was the first two cavemen that were like, yo, we need some fucking I, money. Yeah. You know, is it is was money created to stop war? 
like was back in the day we were just like killing each other for resources but they were like how about we just trade <laughs> you how know? about we just trade some money exactly and then they, maybe you know that's actually not a, like a, a far-fetched idea yeah and I, I don't know i don't know if that's if that's the answer or not and that's what i'm what i guess i'm trying to say is just like it's it's inevitable it's the shit's gonna happen no matter what you know and it's like i don't know you know one of those things that they just like created it's credit isn't that bullshit? Like, right. Yeah. Your credit score. Yeah. Again, another thing to like, I don't want to get all tinfoil hat. Like they're not trying to control you. Right. Because if they were, it, we'd be like fucking, uh, Korea, you yeah, know, yeah, just yeah. like fucking yeah. propaganda <laughs> and it's dark and fucking everything sucks. Um, but I think that that's why we'll never kind of go into like the end of the world war like World War Three is never really going to happen because like people that stand to gain money from that kind of conflict can't use their spoils if they're dead, you know? So it's like, that's why nobody's really going to pull the trigger. Right. And do that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just going to be speculation and kind of like... Flexing muscle. Yeah, flexing muscle, boom, boom, keep the balance, <laughs> like... Hey, this guy's getting too big. We got to fucking figure out a way to assassinate him. Fucking CIA, boom, boom. assassinated. I w I'm sure that shit happens all the time. For sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know it, so I don't. It's like we can't solve it. No. And uh, whoever's out there doing the jobs that we need, even though we don't think we need them, God bless you. Yeah. No, like totally. all the people out there, like national defense and security and shit. Like it takes a fucking special person you to do that. You can't have a regular life. No. You know? No. Um, and then that comes back to what you were saying about your parents, like, just doing this job. Yeah. You know? And, like, I, I can't imagine that a lot of the people that work world security are, like, passionate about it. Yeah. It can't I mean, be. I'm sure, like, there are a couple passionate people, for sure. But and my parent, I don't think my parents, like, hated it. But I don't think they were, like growing up being like i'm gonna join the navy right i think they kind of fell into it and it was like the best thing for them in the moment mm -hmm. to like follow that direction but yeah dude i, I think about sometimes joining the army reserves yeah take care of my fucking school loans dog that's cool but again is that another is school loans was, not, was okay here's another tinfoil hat theory here we're gonna go down the rabbit hole are school loans a guarantee to have soldiers 40 years from when we all got our school loans? Now we know it's a fucking that's farce. Cr that's crazy. Right? So they, they need to hold on to us, and that's the way to hold on to us. Hey, we'll put them in debt forever, and if we really need them, we'll forgive all our fucking debt if they go to war for us. Yeah. You know, just like bargaining chips. Yeah. God damn it. And I, I mean, dude, I don't know. <laughs> it, it depends on how much debt you're talking about some of these people are like in it they're in it wow. they're, they're never gonna pay it off unless he gets no never 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 i almost like accept that fact yeah because you know i'm like whatever if i stopped living to pay my fucking school loans off i would never eat anywhere i would never do anything yeah you know and i'm like i'm not trying to die. I don't want at my at my funeral for people to be like, well, you know, he paid his bills on time. Uh huh. You know, that's really like nobody <laughs> nobody gives a fuck about that. Right. You know what I mean, like, were you yeah. a good person or fucking not? They weren't gonna look at your pull up your credit score. Although it does fuck people over when you're like you, you die with a lot of debt because then your family gets fucking saddled with it. Really. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Depending on uh, like what kind of debt it is. Sometimes like if if uh, you're married. You have some debt, you pass away, and then because your wife is your beneficiary or whatever, like either it go the debt goes to her or you have a cosigner. Like my mom uh -huh. is my cosigner for my student loan. You know what I mean? So if I drop dead, then she's got to fucking pay for all pay that. for the loan. That's fucking yeah. crazy, dude. So it's like you know double insurance, bro. Yeah, <laughs> make sure. Yeah, to anyone out there listening, I would say. If you go to culinary school, 
don't get in a crazy amount of debt. Yeah. Not, I'm not saying don't go because it was sick. Culinary school was dope. I learned a lot. Yeah. I feel like I like came out of school knowing a lot already. Not like being all cocky and shit, but just knowing the basics and the foundation mm -hmm. and having like a safe space for you to like learn all that shit to where you really focus on that. Right. I'm like, yeah, go pursue that shit, but don't get in a crazy amount of debt. If you can do it at a community college or some shit, mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, hell yeah. And then jump into it. That's what I would say. That's what I would do. If I could do it over, mm -hmm. that's what I would do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's some dope advice. I, yeah. I'd say the same shit. And I would just get in too. Do six months in. Cool. Learn, mm -hmm. learn knife skills, all that shit. How to make a vinaigrette. Yeah. Mayonnaise, some basic sauces, sauce work. And then I would just go find the best restaurant that, that would hire me. I would go work there for as long as I could, you know. So they either fired you or you made it all the way to the best station. Yeah, yeah. And then when they give you that, they try to give you the sous chef job, leave immediately. Yeah. <laughs> if your first job tries to give you a sous chef job, <laughs> fucking leave. Oh, gosh. Bounce, dog. <laughs> That's not for you. Um, so out of, out of school, where's your first, like, serious restaurant job? Um. Dude, all right, so, like, out of school, um, I went to help open this restaurant called The Bishop, mm -hmm. which was in uh, Avondale Estates in okay. Atlanta. And it was it was cool. It was kind of a big restaurant, because at the time, um, the general manager's husband was, like, the general manager of, like, the hottest restaurant in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, so it was kind of like we had some hype, and... Uh, it was like contemporary Southern food, just like really good deviled eggs. We had some nice salads, pimento cheese, yeah. fried chicken and grits. There you go. Um, we had like a fried green tomato BLT. Yeah. Chow almondine. It's crazy. I remember like the whole menu because um, it was a while ago. Yeah, but uh, they were hesitant to hire me. And then I think something happened. Like one of their cooks quit like day three. Yeah. And they were like, cool, you're hired. So I like, yeah, I would go there and I worked uh, the cold, cold section and the fryer. Yeah. And um, dude, we just get super busy. Mm -hmm. It was like my first time really working like a station and, you know, we it was like a brand new restaurant too so we were still like figuring out like oh where do the mixing bowls go like yeah do we really like the plates here mm -hmm. or um yeah just going through all of that shit and uh yeah i did that for like i don't know five six months okay and uh met some cool people had uh some talent we had a i had a talented chef his name's zach Chef Zach. Yeah. Fucking took, he, he was kind of like my first mentor for a little bit. Took me under his wing and showed me the way and showed me the ropes. And, um, yeah, then I got a call from my mom and she was like, hey, I'm moving back to California. Do you want to move back to California? So, uh, I, it was like one, one night, like super late, like 3 a.m. And, uh, she had texted me that and I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to buy a plane ticket right now. Mm -hmm. And I think I had like, I bought the ticket and I had like, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars left. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was just committed, dude. And then I looked it up um, where, so I have some family in St. Helena. Um, and I, I didn't really, I had been there before while I was like, the end of middle school or some shit. Yeah. But I didn't really like understand like geographically where it was. <laughs> and so I like looked it up after I bought the ticket and then I like looked up the French laundry. Yeah. And I saw dude, it was like 10 minutes away, uh -huh. 15 minutes away. Right. Um, so that definitely just like kind of like reconfirmed. I was like, all right, well if I'm going to be that close to the French laundry, like yeah. this is probably not like, a bad a bad move so you moved to st helena i moved to st helena yeah because you had family there yeah 
crazy. Yeah, they live there. Uh, what do they they live by? They live on um, off of Spring Street. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. That, that side. Yeah. Saint Helena is a cool town. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. They they live there. Um, they've been there for a long time. Right. What year was this? This when I moved out here, was 2014. 2014, you moved yeah. to Saint Helena. Yeah. Got you. I moved to. Uh, Napa in 2013 December. Cool. That's when I started Crazy. working at Metalwood. Yeah. yeah. So September 2014. Yeah. It uh, was November 28th or December 28th was my hire date. Really? At Metalwood. Fucking wild, and dude. I, I staged like December 18th. Or Man, I listen. I I heard your podcast on it. Um, just about how you got that job. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. You just like, well, you shut up at the back door. Yeah. It's kind of like the chef. It like, was during 12 days, dude. Really? <laughs> there was Wild. a tartine was there doing a guest chef dinner. Wow. And David Kinch was the day after. And I watched David Kinch like he was hashing like probably $5,000 worth of truffles Holy on his shit. board. Holy shit. Just like huge mound, like very calmly just like starting the process so they're like all whole damn and he's like just going you know what i mean and i was like damn this is real this is some real like shit i'm looking around i'm in a three michelin star restaurant chef cat is right there mm -hmm. chef costa is right there kinch is here tartine is here and so it's it, was, it was it was a wild uh stage three days of of 12 days. Yeah. And the, the last three, I didn't even know this shit existed. Um, but yeah, it was so a wild what, time. What was that stage like? Like going into that? Uh, I had to shave a lot of fucking Swiss chard ribbons. Yeah. And I had to shave a shit ton of them because you know Swiss chard is all like cracked at the bottom anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like super hard. And they wanted uh, only shaves that had the... the two colors on the side of it and then the middle white so like you could only get like three of them before you were all white slices and then yeah. you could use that right <laughs> so that shit was annoying. I thought I was going to I thought I was not going to get the job because of that like I was struggling like yeah, it yeah. would take me like fucking an hour two hours to get like a pint you know and I'd be like fuck I suck like I suck you know <laughs> And then, uh, but turns out, like, no, they just needed, they just, they needed. just needed a guy to go inside a room and <laughs> mold Shaves goat me. cheese into fucking ring molds, uh -huh. and then take that goat cheese and like wrap it in preserved apple leaves, like perfectly. So I just like just did that for like a month a after I got hired. Really? Yeah, that's all I did. And then I got, uh, I was table side comi. It was just like going out to the dining room, saucing, showing this bird that we used Damn, to bake in the bread. Really? They let you do that as a comi? Yeah. That's it was crazy. like straight up. Like, That's crazy. Yeah. Everyone uh, was treated like a CDP. Like you, the expectation was that you could just do what you were asked to do when right. you were asked to do it. Yeah. And so we had these spiels that we had to do. We had this crazy fucking dish. It was like sunchoke cereal uh -huh. it was like a chilled sunchoke milk with sunchoke skins were like the flakes like dusted with seaweed and shit and uh we had these cereal boxes made of ceramics and you had to like show up to the table with the box and like <laughs> chef loves cereal and, like pour the fucking <laughs> flakes and pour the milk dude fucking wild but if you fucked That's up crazy. the service like the way you had to do it in the order of you would fucking get roasted. Really? So that was the thing. It's like it was very much a choreographed place. Yeah. And the front of the house was run as strictly as the kitchen. That was the real deciding factor into like why that place was so great. Yeah. Because like the dude who ran the front of the house was like as crazy as Costal basically. So like them together was like a force to be reckoned with so no one everyone wanted to do the right thing by them no right. one wanted to let them down nobody wanted to let each other down yeah so it was a good uh 
good atmosphere in that way. You know, obviously you get a little toxic because of the, the pursuit of perfection, never there, but you expect it to be anyway, right? So, you know, but it's just what it is. So we yeah. just all kind of dug our heels in and did it. I think uh, the pursuit of perfection definitely has a little bit of toxic in it. Oh, for sure. For sure yeah. it does, yeah. It's like per the... Perfectionists in general, you know? So yeah. It's also a very, uh, what is it, a narcissistic endeavor. Yeah. Like perfect for who? Yeah, right. Perfect for you? Yeah. Perfect for what is perfect? It doesn't exist. Does it? You don't know? know? I don't think it does. I think for me, it's more of like, can you stand behind that? Yeah. Like, and, and just anything that you do, whether it's yeah. shaving these like Swiss shard ribbons, like, yeah, that's always, that's always the goal, mm -hmm. I guess. Whether I achieve it every day to the best of my ability, like, but at the end of the day, I always want to be able to be like, okay, I'm proud to like stand behind everything I've done today. Yeah. And if not, like, man, you got to, you got to come back at it the next day, like, and try and be a little better. I think the, the hardest part of that kind of thing is when you did everything you possibly could, but you still have a bad day. Yeah. That, uh -huh. those, that's like the hardest days to deal with because you're like, I don't know that I could have done anything better to make sure that this didn't go the way that it did. And then it did. And then it really, it's always on a night that really fucking matters. Yeah. And it's always like, you know, in these moments, sometimes you catch people's, like you look at people in the eyes and you're like together in that same boat of sorrow. <laughs> you're like trying not to like, you know, it's either that or you look at each other and you laugh because you know that it's, all fucked. it's inevitable in the pursuit of happiness that you're going to fail. Yeah. So like, it's almost like we set ourselves up for this. For sure. Yeah. You know, like I like, set myself up for you to hurt me. Exactly. Or like, oh. or like fucking doing four new dishes on a Saturday night. Like, mm -hmm. is that really necessary? Couldn't we have done this on Wednesday when we were doing 20 covers? Yeah. Like, why do we need to, who are we proving this to? Yeah. And it's almost like, why are we, uh, I asked some chefs, like, why do you do it the way you do it? Why do you hate the things you hate? Is it because a chef told you that was your mentor that that thing is trash? And now that's your opinion because some person told you that that's the way you should think? you know, about a certain ingredient. Like I know a, a kitchen that uh, has outlawed lovage, uh, the herb, right? And it's like, why? Because some person doesn't like it, you know? They're here in the States? Uh, yeah, yeah. Really? And it's just like, I get it. You know, I, I, want, I like outlawing things. Like one of my boys <laughs> outlaws Drake. You know, there he you can't go. listen to Drake in the kitchen. Yeah. So, it's fine, but to sit there and be like, fuck lovage, it is the worst thing on the planet. It's like, I know a couple things that are worse than that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And like, you, and did, did your old chef tell you that? That's, exactly. That's like, oh, I don't use lovage. Oh, why? You know, oh, I don't know. I, I found myself doing that. Like, why do I not like this? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, because someone else didn't like them. And now I have to not like this person or that method. Or that restaurant. Man, it's crazy because I can think of one where, like, I had a sous chef who was like, I fucking hate purple top turnips. And they, like, sent us turnips that had the little purple tops. And yeah. he's like, who accepted this? Like, what? <laughs> you know, I'll never forget it. And I kind of look at those purple top turnips the same way now. Yeah. Even though, like, I don't know, they're still probably pretty good. Yeah, and that's how a lot of ism works, yeah. too, you know? You just like, hey, the community said that we don't like this thing, so we're not going to like it. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know, I just think uh, restaurants are fragile in that you can't even say anything negative about them on Yelp or because the owners will lose their mind, yeah. you know, or like... They're coming after me, but also shame on people for reading a bad review and not going to check it out themselves. 
Like, I get it. If you're on vacation, you're pressed for time. Yeah, you don't have time for a bad meal. I understand. Right, right, right. right. But if you live in the fucking city, someone's going to try to say this restaurant is shitty. I want to know. I want to... I want to be uh, I want it to be proven to me. Yeah, I want it. I want it to be proven. Yeah, because sometimes it depends on what you get, what your experience. Exactly. Is like. And if you have a, if you're having a bad day or not. Yeah. Like, hey, maybe it was just Labor Day and they came back on Tuesday and they had a hard time opening up. Obviously, right. the guests don't care about that, but it's a reason nonetheless. You know. Do you think about that stuff like when you go out to eat? Like, like I, I'm yeah, too Sundays, much. Sundays, do you order seafood? Like uh, I don't really think of it like that. I just know, like, I'll go into the restaurant and know whether I'm going to order seafood or not. Yeah. Based, based on the floor. Based on the bathroom. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Fuck All right. yeah. All right. That's a good idea. I'm like, if your bathroom ain't fucking clean, then I'm not getting your oysters. True. Like. True. You know, half the time, too, like, you got to look at these restaurants. If it's a restaurant that has, like, a raw bar that's ready for oysters, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll eat oysters there all day. But if it's a restaurant that's running an uh, oyster special, chances are they shuck them ahead of time. Uh-huh. They're sitting in the fucking in like uh, ice that's in the walk-in. So now the ice is like hard. So the fucking oysters are like Tipping. all tilted and like dripping out. So they're dry. Right. And it's like, like I've, you know, we used to do that shit when I worked at Charter Road. We'd save them for the next day. We'd throw a lid on the fucking open ice down oysters and the next day we would serve them i mean yeah. you know we never got anybody sick but like just thinking about that i'm like we did it with the most integrity we possibly could i just imagine some restaurants like they don't. leaving them with no ice in a perforated pan like sideways <laughs> and then the next day like coming in and like you know throwing some oil in them because they're fucking that's gross it's kind you know? of gross. Yeah, and it it's totally like, I, I always think about these places. I'm like, where's this fish coming from, first of all? How long have you had yeah, it? Yeah, who cut it? Right. Uh, like, I don't know. And it, uh, it kind of gets to me when I think about it, because there's a lot of people working in this industry that really shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Yeah. And that's a crazy thing. It's like, dude, sometimes I go to restaurants and I like think, I'm like, man, this place is, it's like dirty or like, you know, it's not run very well. And then just knowing, like, just from being a cook, what goes on in a kitchen, like, and I've worked in a lot of places that, like, we really tried to, like, practice good quality, like, chef integrity and running the place. But, you know, just knowing, like, how our kitchen works, I'm kind of curious about some of these places out here. Yeah, for sure. It's probably pretty nasty. Yeah, dude, you, you look at uh, any back lot of any, you know, if their trash cans aren't clean, chances are the bottom of the shelves and the dry storage have not. dust. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like, I'm just a neat freak. So I, I, my cleaning lists are intense that way, <laughs> right? Because every day there needs to be one deep cleaning task. Yeah. Including just like, remove everything from the top shelf and scrub it and then put everything back regardless of if the, if it's dusty or not just to like keep up with it yeah you know there's fucking animals and shit that that love to come through and you know it's fucking nasty it's nasty yeah for sure it's like keep it keep it clean yeah and especially all the fucking e coli and shit all the breakouts right. that have been happening recently yeah. like shit plus when you keep it clean too it's so much easier you have yeah. such an easier time, like, throughout your day. You're not stressed out. Yeah, not at all. Um, so when you moved to St. Helena, where'd you work? Uh, all right, so St. Helena, dude, I moved. I moved there on a Friday, Monday. I went out looking for jobs. I put on, like, a, a, a you know, button down a little time. <laughs> and uh, I actually went and talked to my neighbor. His name's Shannon Kelly. uh uh-huh. He runs uh, Oak Avenue Catering. Okay. So I talked to him. Um, and he hired me right away. Thank you. Um, but it was more like part time, you know, because okay. they were like a catering company doing events. And I was like bottom of the totem pole. So it would be like two days a month right. to start. Um, so I was like, cool. 
And I just went around and like just applied to like every place that I could. Mm -hmm. So I applied to like Market, yeah, on Main Street. Um, I applied to Trevigne, yeah, when Trevigne was there, and uh, just like some delis. There's this restaurant called Dolce. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Um, yeah, the Palisades Deli, mm -hmm. right there at the end, and uh, I got hired at the deli. Okay. Like, so I had just moved out to California. I was like, I don't know, four days in, but I, I just need to make some money at uh -huh. this point. Yeah. I'm trying to like get, get back on my feet and like get some money. And then once I kind of get to that point, try and figure out what the next best move is yeah. and whatnot. So, um, I worked at this deli and they were like, cool, we're going to pay you like $12 an hour. Uh -huh. And I was fucking stoked, dude. It was 2014. I I was just making like eight dollars an yeah. hour. Yeah, I was stoked. I was like, all right, cool. So I would just like come and like run this deli by myself, and um, yeah. And then, like two weeks in, I got an offer from Dolce. Yeah. Next door. Mm -hmm. And. uh yeah, so I just, like, transitioned over there because it was, like, more of a real kitchen. Yeah. And, yeah, it was cool. I worked the nights over there. I did that um, probably for, like, four or five months. Yeah. And it was just a cool opportunity to kind of, like, the chef, his name was Namon. He was really dope. He was kind of more out of the kitchen, though. Mm -hmm. He kind of just, like, trusts us to run it. And it wasn't, like, a super serious restaurant either. It was, like, a good place to, like, jump into, like, a new restaurant job but not have all the pressure yeah. on you. And I got to, like, try to create a lot because I was, like, fresh out of culinary school too. So I was, like, trying to bring in, like, some of these, like, French elements into our steak frites or mm. just stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. I met one of my good friends working there, Charlie. Mm -hmm. He's super cool. We we worked at, um, the, since that job, we probably worked at like four different places together. Yeah. Just throughout the time. And he's in the Navy now, but yeah, it's just cool. Like still talk to him. So um, I did that for a while. And then I knew, Namon actually, the chef, he kind of knew I was like looking for a more serious kitchen. So he ended up going to drink at the bar like one night and he mm -hmm. met um, the sous chef at Terra. Okay. So he ends up getting me like a stage just from talking to them. He was like, I can get you a stage. So like we both walked over there one day and he like introduces me and then we set up a, a day for me to go over there and stage and like check it out. Mm -hmm. It was super cool because it was... Um, you know, growing up in Savannah, there's, like, no Michelin. There's no, none of this Michelin that was, like, in Colorado and Miami. Right. There was none of that, mm -hmm. you know. So I kind of always, like, looked over here as, like, the more serious food. And it was just cool to be able to walk into, like, an establishment that had, like, a star. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to meet the guy behind it all. So, um, yeah, I did the stage. And the stage was, it was really interesting, actually. They made me, they were like, you have 30 seconds to dice an onion. Mm. And then they made me sit down and take like a written test. Yeah. Just asking me like culinary basics and like if I knew who Alice Waters was, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And uh, yeah, they offered me a job. Word. Yeah. Uh, how long you worked there? I only worked there for like, Six months, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think when I first did it, I think it was just a lot. It was a lot to handle. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was necessarily, like, in the position in my life to be able to, like, do that. Because, like, I just moved out to California. I didn't have a car. I was living in Angwin, you know, on the mountain. Yeah. And uh, it was just challenging. I just wasn't set up like mm -hmm. for it yet. And uh yeah. Yeah, I had a really rough night, like 
my station partner, she was like going to the CIA over there. And she was like really late one day because of school. Yeah. And then we kind of had a rough service. And they like sat us down at the end of the night and they were like, we need to figure out like what's going on. You know? Yeah. You guys need to like straighten, straighten your side of the street up because like we can't have this happen again. Right. And she basically just threw me under the bus in front of them. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I was like devastated, dude. You know? Um, yeah, so I kind of was just like, I need to like go figure out some stuff. Mm -hmm. So I ended up leaving there. Um, and at this point, I was working for the catering company. Right. I was still working for them, like on, like here and there, but like right. I really started to work for them a lot. So um, that was like completely different. Yeah. It's like cooking volume. Um, we would we would go and cater at, at like a lot of wineries. It's mainly wineries. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just like big parties and the food was kind of it was pretty high end because it was like a, a lot of it was like for like wine release stuff Parties, like that yeah. yeah a lot of wine pairings so it was like weddings weddings yeah yeah we would do like anywhere from 10 to like you know 1200 mm. yeah so we would go hard they would go hard and and everything from oak avenue was like made in-house right yeah Maybe they weren't making the bread mm -hmm. at the time, but I think now they're making the bread. Um, so, yeah, that was just, like, you know, super dope. I knew, like, Shannon, the chef, was, like, really talented. Mm -hmm. He's He had been out in Napa for a long time, 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, and just, like, cooking out in, in the valley. Yeah. Just, like, he used to be the executive chef at Shandon. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he was just like, he was probably my first real mentor, mm -hmm. like a hundred percent. Yeah. Just like showing me the ropes, recipes, businesses, you know, he was kind of almost like a father figure, like out. That's like my like chef dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that chef dad. Yeah. Um. So you're getting your fucking, you're cutting your teeth at this point. Cut my teeth, dude. Yeah. That's what I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to do at this point. I'm just trying to like, get experience. Yeah. Just get in the mix and fucking get crushed and see what it's like and yeah, make well, make money and yeah. Fuck bitches, make money. Uh, uh, <laughs> when did you? When did you um, move? Or how long did you live in Angwin? Um, I lived in Angwin for like, I don't know, two years. Okay. Yeah. So I like lived in St. Helena for a little bit. I lived in Angwin for two years. And then I moved to Napa for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where'd, uh, where'd you work after the last place? Um, so I was working for the catering company. And then, you know, just throughout the years, like, um, there was like the slow season. Right. So I'd have to like find other jobs. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So I worked at Inglenook Winery. Okay. Too. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, the chef, his name's Alex. Yeah. He's super dope. You know, super talented. Um, I worked at like a hotel. I forget the name. At hotel Dimitri mm -hmm. in Calistoga. Um, I helped open up Compline for a little bit. Okay. The wine bar out there, and then. I kind of did like some private chefing too, mm -hmm. like here and there. Like we we did a wedding. I did a wedding when I was like twenty three. Yeah, for like one hundred and sixty. Damn, that was cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make some money, dude, and um, be able to like write the menu and yeah. It was kind of my first like real test of like write the menu, talk to the clients. They give the approval and give you some money, and then. Now you got to go find all this shit. Now you got to make it happen. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. It's, it's just like, rough. Where do you buy like trout? You know? Right. Or, right. Like, where do you buy salmon? And you're like, well, I'll just go to like Whole Foods. And then you go to Whole Foods and they don't have it. Then what do you do? You yeah. Know? And it's just like, I don't know. 
Yeah, it's challenging. It's like paying fucking retail prices for yeah. salmon, bro. Yeah. Cool. That's what I'm saying. If you're private chefing out there, be strategic with your menu planning. Yeah. Like, yeah. For are sure. you going to be able to find that shit at the grocery store? Food yeah. cost is important. Yeah. Everywhere. For sure. Um, yeah. So I was, I was doing that for a while. Um, and then we had some crazy fires in Napa. I remember. Yeah. That, that was pretty. That was the year that Meadow would burn down. No, it was before that. Oh, the other ones. Yeah, I was I like, know, I know which ones you're talking about. It's like two years before that, so yeah. like 2017, oh, I think. The, I remember my sous chef was displaced. Yeah. Sous chef Hugo. Yeah, that was wild. Dude. Yeah. Um, I remember that night coming home and it was just so windy, mm -hmm. and then, like, I get home ten minutes later, I just hear like, I'm in Napa at this point, and I just hear like hello sirens and like helicopters flying over and i'm like dude what's going on like turn on the tv to see if like something's on the news and uh then a friend of mine called me and they were like yo like uh, there's a fire there's a fire out there so we drove to it actually like yeah right, it was like right when it first started and um yeah it was crazy it spread so fast yeah and at one point it was like four separate fires over the there's like a fire out in calistoga there was one in um carneros yeah one in napa and one in yontville mm -hmm. and uh my mom had just moved in england to like another spot in england and uh you know how it is like up there there's no cell service yeah she didn't have her internet hooked up yet and so i was like i was getting worried like who's gonna like tell her mm -hmm. you know um, and then I also thought too, is like, not a lot of people have been to a new spot yet. Cause she was literally like five days in. Mm -hmm. So just like blowing her phone up, like trying to get a hold of her. And, uh, then I was like, fuck it. I gotta, I gotta go up there. So like 3 AM fires are like fucking raging all around the Valley. Like Yauntville, the Hills like on it fire. Like, it was like red. Yeah. Everything it was straight was like red. red. And it's windy as fuck, too, so there's, like, yeah. trees and branches everywhere. It's, like, it's crazy. It's like a movie. Yeah. and uh, I remember that. It was, like, the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I wake up my mom, and she... actually had a party at Bilko's, end of the world party. Really? Yeah, it was dope. It was, like, one of the funnest nights I've ever <laughs> downtown Napa. I forgot about Bilko's. <laughs> Bilko's dope. 200 beers on tap. I'm like, dude, imagine the fucking keg changing that has to go on in this For fucking sure. place. For sure, yeah. Weirdo fucking bartender over there. Um. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it was just weird. Um, I remember we had to evacuate for like three weeks, something like that. Yeah, where'd you go? Uh, so the crazy thing is we actually, my ex-girlfriend and I, we had a hotel down here. We were going to come vacation down here. Okay. For like the weekend or some shit. Right. And we had already booked it before the fire. And um, yeah, so, you know, the fire happened and then we just came down here and that was, it was kind of like my first introduction to Monterey. Oh, dope. Coming down here and going to the aquarium and um, just seeing it. You know, and the crazy thing is, like, I didn't even come all the way out to Big Sur. Mm -hmm. I just saw, like, Cannery Row. Like, some of the bullshit, like, tourist highlights out here. Right. Which are still cool. But when I feel like when you're more local, you know the spots. Is there a good, yeah. like, fried fish spot around here? Fried fish. Like, just like a good calamari fucking fisherman's platter. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I guess. I it, love that shit. I do too, dude. Like next yeah. to the water, that's where I go. Yeah. The spot where I can get a beer and some fucking fried things. There's some fried shrimp. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Um. And uh, where the fuck are we in your trajectory? Yeah, so, all right. So, yeah, I came out here. First time I saw Monterey. The fires are raging in Napa. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I feel like I, I got to move here. I was like, I got to move here, but... Um, yeah, so just through a friend, like, I kind of had a connection into Single Thread. Okay. Up in Sonoma. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, I heard that they were hiring at the time. They had just opened. It was like four months into them, five months into them. Oh, wow. Opening. Okay. Something like that. Um, and then I just applied and asked if I could have a stage. And yeah, I got, they emailed me back and I got a stage for three days. Mm -hmm. And I was super nervous. Yeah.